This is David W. Williams, also known as Diamond Dave, the founder of the highest paid part-time job in the world options training program. We're getting ready to go into Market Mondays for 4-12-2021. And the reason why we do Market Mondays is to give you a market-based conversation, a market-based perspective, create something that's going to be very, very succinct and concise. We don't want to really hold you for a long period of time. And to get you to understand that you can benefit from what's going on in the market. And so what we're going to try to do is bring you a market-based conversation in a very, very common tongue, utilizing people that talk and act like the kind of people in your regular or your normal everyday day-to-day life. And so let's go ahead and get into it. So today is 4-12-2021. And what we saw is we saw the market pretty much open red and pretty fall the majority of the day. Not a drastic fall, but we really didn't see a, a really spike in the market. And we talked about this weekend with the uh, weekend stock market talk. And I would encourage you to kind of tap into that and kind of get a heads up on how the weekend is going to look or how the week is going to look. And we kind of do that on the weekend. As we talked about that, we have been green for so many days. It was very likely that the market was going to open up red uh, because a lot of things had kind of been priced in. So we're going into a really, really good earnings week, but we're also going into probably a good two to three week run of a lot of really, really important earnings for specific companies. And because of the the optimism in the market over the past, let's say, uh, you know, two weeks almost, we believe that a lot of the um, good earnings results may have already been priced in. So, you know, we saw people try to probably take a little bit of profit today. And so what we're going to have this week is we're going to have a lot of really, really important bank earnings. So a lot of big bank earnings this week. One of the most important numbers that we're going to be looking at is for loan, what we call loan volume. Uh, how many loans are they? Uh, uh, how many loans are they successful in selling to the public? Because what that's going to kind of give us an understanding of is what is the health of the American consumer right now? We're getting a lot of data that a lot of American consumers are underwater financially, they're underwater economically. We may see a correlation with that data and loan volume. Then we also want to get guidance on those particular from those particular financial institutions. What are their plans for the future? How are they going to adjust to inflation and changes in the consumer market? Because we talked about begin uh, what we've seen as a result of COVID is that a lot of Americans have been damaged financially and they have not been able to repair themselves as of yet. So then that can put a drain on housing, getting cars, things of that nature. We know the banks make money by selling money. So then how does consumer confidence or consumer fitness affect the bank industry? And we kind of think that the bank numbers this week may set the tone for earnings season, maybe outside of the tech sector. So I think that bank earnings may set the tone for uh, a large part of the S&P 500. But I think that the NASDAQ is, or the QQQ is going to be unaffected because people are so bullish around tech right now. And they'll always use tech as a safe harbor when the other areas of the market they believe are off. Now, let's go into the jump out. So we're going to talk about companies that um, did well and didn't do well and kind of give you some context. Now, I want to give you a quick disclaimer. This is not investment advice. I'm not a fiduciary. I'm not here to represent you financially. We're just here to give you some information, some entertainment and give you a really good market based perspective. We're looking at NVIDIA. NVIDIA put out um, the CFO came out and said that their earnings were going to be better as expected for the first quarter of this year. So as a result, when that information hit the market, NVIDIA started to move up really, really, really rapidly, right? Because they're a tech company. And like I said before, is that a lot of people are bullish on everything that they believe is tech related. And NVIDIA is not a fly by night operation. They're a very, very solid company. They really know what they're doing. And so when the CFO came out with that information, it gave people a lot of confidence, right? And that NVIDIA would be a really, really good place to start putting their money uh, as a, as a, in, in opposition or in comparison to other places in the market, right? So NVIDIA started to shoot up really, really late, uh, probably towards the end of the second session, and it kept pretty much moving up the rest of the day. Now, let's look at a farrier or this ticker is APHA came out with earnings this morning uh, and the earnings were very disappointing. And what we saw is we saw them kind of tank really, really bad on the open. Right. So you see that real big, big red bar on the open and then it pretty much went went down the rest of the day. So one of the things that is. I would be optimistic about it is that it opened at four around 1450 and it didn't continue to sell off. So it stopped at around 1395. So really over the session, it lost around what, let's say a dollar, a dollar, almost a dollar 50. But even though it closed down um, almost a dollar 50. Right. So it closed around six. Okay, I'm sorry. So it closed. It, it opened about two dollars lower than the close on Friday. But during the session, it didn't lose that much. So it lost 14 percent, 
right? I understand the percentage looks bad, but the dollar amount is not that bad, right? And what we didn't see is that it didn't start really spiking down really, really rapidly. So it could recover uh, because they're supposed to be merging with Tilray later this week. However, their numbers were really not that great. Okay. So what you want to do is ask yourself, is this a good place to put my money? And we may go into the marijuana market. I uh, have a conversation about that, especially with these Canadian based companies that don't even really operate inside the United States. A hundred percent. Um, but that's the deal with, with a farrier and we're going to look at Tilray. Tilray kind of sold off, right? They gapped down also in the open because people know that they're merged with a farrier and the farrier's numbers were so bad. Now Tilray has been selling off from $60. It was about $60 about two months ago. It's been selling off since then. Okay. So the question you want to ask yourself is that if these two companies merge, what's going to change? You got two companies that are, if you look at their yearly chart, they're both going down. So uh, they're going to merge and create one really, one really big, uh, one big badly managed company or are them combining going to make the situation better? Because if you got two companies that are not being managed well and they combine or they merge, what's changed? Now you got a big or bad situation. So I'm not really sure what that's going to do. A lot of people are optimistic about the marijuana space because of state legislation. Um, I could give you a really, really uh, in-depth dissertation about the federal government and how they look at marijuana. That really doesn't have anything. It doesn't matter what the state thinks um, because you can still end up in a USP. Um, marijuana uh, is not bankable because of federal regulation. So I'm not as bullish on it until lo federal lawmakers legalize it. So from a consumption standpoint, cool. You know, you can smoke weed in your state. That's cool. From a business standpoint, I'm really not bullish on it because it's still federally illegal, which means the DEA, um, maybe even the ATF, the FBI, whatever depart, whatever federal department can show up and prosecute you for marijuana. And you are not going to be able to hide behind the state. So these are Canadian based companies. So maybe they can, you know, operate in Canada. But I don't understand how they're going to be effective inside the United States, because then essentially they have to push their products inside the United States, which means that the federal government can come down on them as a result. So nobody's really been able to explain to me that without the federal legislation actually being enacted, well, we're going to just totally decriminalize marijuana. Or legalize marijuana, however you want to uh, state it, how it's something that is uh, a good place to invest your money. Now, I understand that, yeah, it eventually will happen. But my my argument always is when you're looking at speculative companies. If it's going to be a viable company, it'll be a viable company in a year. So if the federal government, I don't think it's Schumer, is going to push for federal decriminalization or legalization of marijuana. Well, what why does it matter if you get in at seventeen nineteen or if you get in at thirty dollars? Doesn't really matter. Unless you're you know one of those people that's buying millions of shares and then it does matter. But if you're gonna buy a hundred shares, you know, I understand it does matter from a uh you know a balance sheet standpoint, but letting these letting things happen federally and letting the situation actually be real and then you go in may be better than you coming in at sixty Thinking that, well, because Biden got elected, even though it don't really make a lot of sense because Biden and his his vice president have essentially uh, presided over incarcerating millions of people. So I don't see the connection between them, you know, you know, a kind of pushing in legislation of marijuana. But that's what people want to believe. I'm cool with that. But my thing is, let it happen first. Then. You'll be able to pick the portfolio of viable companies that have good management. They've got good prospects for the future. They're putting it back good numbers. Their team is actually good. They got a good business model. They have some type of geographical advantage. They have some type of moat around their business. Then you can select from those particular companies. But as of right now, like I said before, is you know, I'm somebody that really understands this space. The federal government can show up and take everybody to prison. And you will not be able to hide behind what's legal in my state. That don't mean nothing to these folks. You're dealing with the feds now. You're not dealing with the state. They can put you in a USP behind this. So I, I'm not 
optimistic about any of this space until the federal government comes out and puts in law that either we're going to decriminalize it or we're going to make it legal. I don't care what this state, because I'm telling you, you're not going to be able to hide behind the state if the feds show up. And I know a lot of people can't wrap their head around that because it's not a lifestyle that they come out of. But I'm not enthusiastic about investing in a business where at any time the feds can show up and take everybody to prison. And there's nothing that you can do except try to fight it in federal court. And we already know how they play ball. You know, they got a 90 percent conviction rate. So then where does my money go as a corporation? So these are Canadian based companies, but we got U.S. based marijuana companies. There's even some in the state that I operate in that I currently live in right now. There was some when I was living in Georgia. I don't understand how they're operating. Like I said, for a lot of them, they're not bankable because of federal, I think, federal money laundering laws. Right. So I'm just really not optimistic about the space. And maybe there's somebody that's listening to this video that can educate me on the prospects of these particular companies in the future, uh, even though the federal government is against them. But I'm just not. So don't want to ramble, but I want to go ahead and just, you know, express myself on that particular point. Now, let's talk about high frequency trading firms. This is going to be our topic of the day. So a lot of people um, don't really understand what high frequency trading firms are or they think that there's something negative about high frequency trading firms. And this is a story that really started getting really big, like in the late 90s, early 2000s uh, because of the uh, expansion of technology, but also the expansion of like Internet access, broadband access. Uh, what a high frequency trading firm essentially is, is that a firm that using a lot of computers, algorithms, coding, uh, technology has the ability to uh, and technology is really a semantic term. So really, they have a process, really, right, to execute a large amount of trades in a short amount of time. So really what high frequency trading firms have done is they've created um, computer programs that allow them to execute a large amount of trades, right? In the, in the hundreds of thousands, maybe even sometimes in the millions of trades in a relatively short amount of time. And I say short amount of time, I mean millions, right? And th that's what they're about, right? So then a lot of times they execute trades on behalf of uh, themselves and maybe even sometimes their clients or maybe other firms, right? Because they have that ability to function in that particular area in that way. Many people think that's their advantage. They think their advantage is the fact that you know, they have programs that allow them to execute a large amount of trades in a relatively short amount of time. And they think that technological process is their advantage. My argument is, is that's not their advantage. Their advantage is that they have direct access to the exchanges. Right. So high frequency firms have direct access to the exchanges. What do I mean by that? They have direct access, direct line access to the New York Stock Exchange. They have direct access to other exchanges. So then therefore, their trades get executed faster, right, than retail. And even sometimes faster than other high frequency trading firms. So I want to give you an example. Excuse me. If you could call somebody tomorrow, let's say you want to make a trade on Apple for 50 shares. You want to buy 50 shares of Apple. And you're able to get on your cell phone and call somebody at the New York Stock Exchange. And because of who you are, the call is going to go straight through. And the person on the other end is going to pick your phone up and you're going to say, hey, man, buy $50 of Apple at this. Oh, just do $50 of Apple at market price, which means that whatever the price is on the floor at that particular time, buy $50 of Apple. And the person knows that you're good for it. So they say, OK, cool. And they directly go and they buy $50 worth of Apple. Right. Because who you are, the strength of your name, the weight that you carry, the call going to go through. They're going to pick the call up. And as soon as you say it, they're going to tell the, you know that person to go ahead and execute the trade. That gives you an advantage. Why? Because you got direct access to the market. You got direct access to the exchange. You don't have a, a, a computer program that has a process to do millions of trades in 30 seconds. That's not what you have. What do you have? You have direct access to the exchange. What well, gets high frequency trading firms the advantage is they have direct access to the exchanges. The average retail trader doesn't. You're going through a brokerage, which then is going through an order executor. So you got a lot of times as a retail trader, you're going through multiple people to get your trades executed, which means that there's a lag in your trade. The high frequency trading firms don't have that issue. So a lot of times when you're looking at the market, a lot of times you'll see high frequency traders. First thing when the market opens, you'll see their activity, right? And so I think I have this on a slide, right? Okay, so here we go. We do have it on a slide. So this is GameStop on 4-8 at 9.30 a.m. 
we had 875 in volume on this particular candle. Right? So it opened at 185. It's a one minute candle, open at 185, and it closed at 184. And so we had 875,000 in volume in one minute. And so what I want you to understand is that because high frequency trading firms have direct access to the market, they can essentially do what we call front front run trades, which means that their orders can get executed a lot faster than retail because they have direct access to the market. It's not necessarily the speed. It's not necessarily the amount of trades that they can do is that essentially they can get to the front of the line. And so therefore, in a in a in a race for being first. If you know that you can get to the front of the line, it, that's what gives you the advantage, not the amount or the volume of trading that you can do. Now, as a retail trader, you may say, hey, well, you know what? I can't compete with that, yada, yada, yada. Your, your job is not to compete with that, right? None of the trades that I'm successful at is, is because I beat somebody to the punch, right? Because I'm not trading that kind of volume anyway. I don't trade that kind of volume. High frequency trading firms, they have to be first because they're trading so much volume. They're not trading like 100 shares. They're trading a lot of times millions of shares. So there was a necessity to increase speed of trading, right? Because of the, uh, the amount of the volume that they want to facilitate, there was a necessity to increase the speed of trading. But they before they started working on speed of trading, they always had direct access to the exchanges. So as a retail trader, you got to understand that your advantage is never going to be speed. It's never going to be uh, um, volume. It's going to be your psychology. And it's going to be your understanding of the particular company that you're trading and also your understanding of market conditions. Right. Because you shouldn't believe that those people at those high frequency traded firms are smarter than you. They're more intelligent than you, even though they may have a computer program that can execute trades at a faster rate than you. And they also can uh, get direct access to the exchanges. So you may not be first, but then you don't base your trading around being first. Right. You don't base your trading around being able to beat high frequency traders to the punch. OK. So this is something that I wanted to really talk about, but you'll see the characteristics of these particular firms in the market. A lot of times early in the market and a lot of times late in the day, you'll see either people uh, selling a lot of shares or buying a lot of shares. And you'll see really, really, really big candles, especially on the one minute and the five minute, sometimes of millions of volume and a relatively short amount of time. And that's often high frequency trading firms getting in or coming out of positions. So that's going to be market Mondays for. Uh, 412 2021. Hope you got value from it. If you know somebody that's going to get value from it, share it out. If you want to know more about the highest paid part time job in the road options training program, reach out to me. Hope you're having a good spring. It's getting real hot where we're at. Hope y'all enjoying the weather. This is David W. Williams, also known as Diamond Dave, and I'll talk to you later.